forever and ever, on ages of ages, amen. Let us as God's people join together and ascend into his presence and worship him in spirit and in truth. Please stand with me for our call to worship. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most often quoted psalm in the entire New Testament. And once we read it, you will know why. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. 
You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink by the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask that you would be with us today to live among us, to teach us, to bring us closer to you as we freely give our hearts to you, that you would inhabit the praise of your people, that you would receive from us what we have to offer to you. For you are a great God, worthy of praise, glory, honor, and power. So bless us today, not because we are worthy, not because we have done anything to force you to love us, not because we bring any righteousness to you and add to you in any way, but because we are united with the Holy One, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We can take all the names that we can ascribe to God, all the wonderful descriptors of him and his goodness and his glory, but none of them will be sufficient to adequately explain who this God is that we worship. So let us sing with joy in our hearts, join all the glorious names.
As we come before our holy God, we recognize our need, our sin, so compels us to fall before him and worship him alone as the provider of our salvation. For he provides a great salvation through a great savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So at this time it's appropriate for us to confess our sins and cleanse our hearts to receive what he has for us as we continue to worship him today. So let us pray together this confession of sin. Our Father, you bid us come and drink deeply from the cup of blessing and sweet wine of the gospel. But we draw from broken cisterns the putrid water of our own self-righteousness. You set before us a board lavishly supplied with every good food, wisely and wonderfully prepared, spiritual food upon which we can be continually nourished and eternally satisfied. Yet we content ourselves with stolen bread eaten in secret. Such is our sinful nature. We seek satisfaction from creation while forsaking our Creator, who alone can satisfy our deepest longings and fill our souls to overflowing. Forgive our attempts to find pleasure apart from your good pleasure. Forgive us for exchanging liberty for license and for neglecting the truth that sets us free. Forgive us for exalting ourselves and using your blessed Son as though he were some charming commodity sent to serve our selfish ends. Create in us such disdain for sin that would drive us to despair of all hope, save that which can be found in Christ alone. May we feed upon him by faith through word and sacrament. May the presence of his spirit comfort us. Give us peace of heart and mind as we rest in the righteousness of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. We receive this glorious assurance of pardon. As we read from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Listen with joy and peace. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Glory to God. Amen and amen. Our souls need to arise and wake up and praise God. So let us stand together and sing, Arise, my soul, arise. <laughs>
my beloved and blessed fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters in Christ, what is it that you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, he spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Our God is a wonderful God who does not leave himself without a witness in so many things and a most special and significant witness are the words he gives to us in Holy Scriptures. So attend, attend and attend. Listen carefully and apply to your hearts the reading of the words from the Holy Scriptures. Today's New Testament scripture reading comes from Hebrews, second chapter, verses 9 through 18. If you're using a pew Bible, you can find that on page 1001. Again, it's Hebrews 2, 9 through 18. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest 
in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May the Lord give us understanding of his most holy word. We move from those encouraging, comforting words from Hebrews chapter 2 and reflect on the fact that our God refreshes our soul and our bodies and we'll have that opportunity to experience that as we participate, those of us by faith, in the Lord's Supper, which is later on. So may we sing the song, recognizing that he is the only one who can refresh us in the way that we really need it. So let us stand together and sing, Shepherd of Souls, Refresh and Bless. We'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Judges, chapter 17, as we pick back up where we left off in our study in this uh, extraordinarily interesting and diverse and oftentimes confusing, disappointing and yet exciting book. As we uh, come to Judges, chapter 17, let me remind you again that this is God's holy and inspired word, our only infallible rule for faith and for life. And because it is the word of God, uh, we certainly need to pay close, close attention. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be my son by Yahweh. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver 
to his mother, his mother said, I dedicate the silver to Yahweh from my hand for my son to make carved image and metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I might find a place. Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes for your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with a man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained a Levite, and the young man became his priest, and he was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that Yahweh will prosper me, because I have a Levite as priest. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as we look at this passage, as we seek to understand what these words mean and how you would apply them to our own lives. We pray that by your Spirit, uh, you would guide us into this truth, that you would open our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears, so that we might behold wonderful things from your word to the end that we might be better suited to live for your honor and for your glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. There is uh, a lot of debate as to where this, these chapters, these final chapters fit in the narrative that we have uh, before us, presented to us uh, in the book of Judges. Uh, some believe that, uh, you know, they belong, these chapters belong right where they are in chronologically, that they just follow uh, Sam, the Samson story. Uh, Others believe they relate to a later time, uh, perhaps during the early years of the monarchy of David. Some believe, and I tend to agree, that they actually are a recapitulation um, of that which we find prior to the the first judge. And so if if you uh, go back and read uh, the early... Uh, chapters, uh, chapter 2 of Judges. I just refer you to that right now. Uh, you find uh, the death of Joshua in Judges 2.6. And the comment in 2.7, the people served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had, been, who had seen all the great work that Yahweh had done for Israel. And then, of course, uh, Joshua dies at the age of uh, 110 years. And in verse 10, 
And all that generation also gathered to their fathers. And then this little clue. And there arose another generation after them who did not know Yahweh or the work that he had done for Israel. So as we enter into the third major section of the book of Judges, I believe that what this section, beginning in chapter 17, does is bring us back to uh, Judges chapter 2 to describe what a former professor of mine refers to as uh, generational degeneration. That is, a, a continual decline in the moral fabric and structure of the people of God. For a season, uh, they had Moses. For the next season, they had Joshua. Joshua now has died. That generation that lived in obedience to Joshua has died, and now the people are left foundering uh, without any leadership, without uh, faith, really, without anything anchoring them uh, to ultimate reality or truth for their lives. And I think that's where we find ourselves uh, again, beginning now in Joshua chapter 17. So as we uh, return, or in Judges chapter 17, forgive me, as we return to Judges and chapter 17, uh, let's kind of pick up and see where this takes us. Uh, the first thing uh, that we find is an introduction to a man uh, living in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And uh, Micah uh, is a, uh, a fella who is living with his mother and in course in those days it didn't mean the same thing as it does now uh, because we had a lot of intergenerational families that were all living under the same roof in those days but uh, evidently um, he had pilfered from his mother uh, a large sum of money and uh, which you find in, in verse 2 the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse. Uh, she must have blistered the uh, paint off the wall after she found out that the money was gone. Uh, he said uh, to her, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And uh, son of a gun, she, she didn't uh, raise Cain or, you know, chide him or... or you know, speak evil of him and what he had done. Uh, she, she uh, rather, after having pronounced uh, the curse, uh, blessed her son. Um, blessed be my son by Yahweh. Uh, the interesting thing about all of this is that uh, although we are entering into a time that describes the the moral uh, decline of Israel, the formal aspects of the religion of Israel are somewhat intact. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, Levites and ephods, and um, uh, we're talking about, you know, the formal covenantal name of Yahweh. All of these things you would think would uh, portend uh, kind of a positive spin on things, but what we find is just the opposite. So she, she says, blessed be my son by Yahweh. And uh, so she takes that money that he has restored uh, and takes a portion of it, uh, uh, 200 pieces of silver in, in uh, verse uh, 4, and she gives it to a silversmith uh, with the instruction, evidently, that he turn it into a carved image or a metal image. And then, when she got it from the silversmith, she placed it in, uh, in her home in the house of Micah. And then we're told in verse 5 uh, that this man Micah had a shrine. 
Uh, in other words, he had a, a little private um, place in the house where he would do his devotions and pray, and and uh, perhaps you know he would reflect upon um, you know God's uh, kindness, mercy, goodness, whatever. Um, so he he puts this um, uh, uh, idol that his mother has commissioned uh, into his collection, into his shrine, and then uh, he uh, furnishes uh, an ephod. And of course, if you know what an, an ephod is, an ephod is basically uh, the the garment that was uh, Moses. God instructed Moses to create for the high priest. Uh, of, of God's people. And, and the ephod was to be worn only by the high priest. And the high priest was only to be one that was actually from uh, the tribe of Levi and, and, that, uh, and Aaron, and, and that he himself uh, was the one who would make sacrifices and intercede on behalf of the people while wearing this ephod. The ephod had 12 stones on it representing the 12 tribes. It had a a, a kind of a talisman kind of effect whereby when the priest wore it, he could inquire of the Lord as to what was going on and, uh, and what needed to be done, so forth and so on. So here you have Micah, though, taking that which God had commanded to be a good thing for the people of Israel and turning it into something other uh, than a good thing. So, after this description of Micah's and his mother's activity, you have this refrain that you find in Judges chapter 17, 18, and 19. In verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone was, uh, did what was right in their own eyes. That serves as kind of a centerpiece. It's the axis upon which these narratives turn. It's the, it's the central idea of the text upon which we fix our attention because it gives us the information that we need on how to rightly interpret all of these different incidents that are recorded for us uh, in the narrative. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. And by that comment is meant to reflect that what Micah and Micah's mother were doing was just that which was right in their own eyes. They weren't really interested in what was right in Yahweh's eyes. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. Uh, I think that uh, this is probably indicative uh, of what we find in every generation. Uh, every generation uh, has um, uh, two kinds of people in it. Uh, you have people who are what were referred to in the Old Covenant people of God. They were referred to as the remnant of Israel. And those who were a part of the remnant of Israel were people who were, you know, by and large faithful uh, to their covenant God. And they sought to live their lives under his authority and according to his revealed word for them. Uh, the rest of the Israelites and of course all of the surrounding nations uh, were those who were simply trying to make sense of it all uh, uh, without the benefit of a special revelation from God and without the benefit of being a part of God's covenant community by faith. And they are the ones uh, for whom this statement uh, 
fits their way of life, their choices, and their attitudes. And it is also not only true in ancient Israel in in those days that you have people of faith and people doing what is right in their own eyes, uh, some of whom belong to the nation Israel, some of whom obviously do not. But it is just as true in our own age, in our own time, that you have people uh, who are a part of what we now uh, refer to as the invisible church. And the invisible church exists within the context of the visible church. It's that you know, true Israel uh, remnant and all the others who are uh, pretenders or doing their own thing, what is right in their own eyes, in a new covenant context. So when we look at uh, our own situation, our own day and time and what's going on around us, we find that uh, there is a people that God has uh, brought about as a result of uh, the new creation that uh, is bringing uh, people into uh, the uh, proper and right relationship with God through Christ, uh, through his uh, offices of uh, prophet, priest, and king. Uh, you have the true believers, the remnant within a modern context, and then you have those who are still described uh, by these words used of uh, ancient Israelites in rebellion against God. Uh, in those days, there was no king, and everyone is, was doing what is right in their own eyes. And I think, you know, it doesn't take a great deal of imagination uh, to recognize that we are living, strangely enough, in the same, in, in the same time as the very writing of the book of Judges. Um, everybody was doing what is right in their own eyes then, and when we look around, what do we find? Uh, Steve reminded me of this this morning when, when uh, he told me that he was watching the news and he just he was uh, watching an interview with the uh, the coach of uh, the girls the ladies basketball team from South Carolina. And uh, you know, rather than uh, uh, representing the university honorably. Uh, and keeping her own opinion to herself, she felt the need to explain her view that she felt it was perfectly fine for transgender women to compete with women in college athletics and was looking forward to the day when that could happen. So you know who I'm not rooting for uh, in the final uh, finals here. That's everybody doing what is right in their own eyes. What we, what we see happening around us is a result of a jettisoning of truth. Um, Paul makes uh, the point in his opening salvo in his magnum opus, the book of Romans, uh, that uh, though they, that is those who are outside of the faith, Though they know God, they do not acknowledge him as God. Because we're made in the image of God, we have the hardwiring in place to know God. We, you cannot not know God. There is no atheist who doesn't know God. His atheism is an attempt to suppress the truth about God so that he doesn't have to find himself accountable to that God. That's just the way it is. You know, the saying is that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, the truth of the matter is there just simply are no atheists. Because God has created eternity in our hearts. We all know innately, because we're made in the image of God, that there is 
a God and that we owe everything to him because we're creatures and he's the creator. That's the hard-line truth of the matter. So it takes a great deal of energy to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. As Paul says, the natural man is always doing. Those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness untether themselves from their moorings, that which holds them, that which keeps them, that which hems them in. The thing that hems us in is the truth. When that truth is suppressed, then all hell breaks loose. And that's what we see in our own time, and that's basically what's been going on in every generation uh, since the fall. So we have here then that commentary on human activity. In these days, uh, there was no king in Israel, and everybody was doing what is right in his own eyes. So we've arrived, uh, because of this, we've arrived at the absurd position of coming to the conclusion that uh, truth is relative. And, and I can have my truth, and you can have your truth. And they could be uh, entirely opposed to one another, and yet somehow be equally true. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, I think, a sad commentary on our school system that logic is not being taught because something cannot be and not be at the same time. Uh, something, can be, something can be true or untrue, but something can't be true and false at the same time. That's just not possible. So this is where we live. This is, the, this is the, the world in which God has called his people to speak truth into the marketplace of ideas. This is our calling. This is our vocation as God's people. Well, let's continue in the narrative here and uh, pull out a few more uh, things that might be useful to us. In uh, the course of uh, the activities of Micah and his mother and the creation of the idol and the inclusion into the shrine and uh, the metal images and the ephod that, and, and the, <laughs> the ordaining, uh, you know, talk about... Um, uh, brazen, you know, Micah somehow believes that he has the authority to ordain his own son to become a priest. Where'd that come from? Out of thin air. Uh, so, uh, in verse 7, the, the story continues. I should say the tragedy continues. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. He sojourned into Ephraim. And he uh, stumbled upon, quite by accident, of course, uh, the house of Micah. Uh, the man departed from his town in Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. He's looking for a place. Uh, he is uh, described as a Levite, and being a Levite, you would think that he would already have a place, right? Wouldn't his place be, you know, uh, at the center of worship and ministering to the people of God? But no, he's, he's not satisfied with God's, you know, uh, will for his life. He, he, he wants to uh, travel into a far country and sow his oats and uh, do his own thing. So uh, he stumbles upon Micah and his home. And uh, so Micah 
in verse 9 says to him, well, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am, I, he, didn't, he didn't ask who you are and what you are, you know, what do you do for a living? He said, where'd you come from? And the first thing that comes out of this guy's mouth is, well, I'm a Levite. As though that's supposed to mean something. Which it probably did carry some interesting baggage. I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. I'm, I'm just kind of wandering around looking for a new home. Well, Micah says to him in verse 10, well, stay with me. Uh, you can be a father to me, and you can be a priest to me. And I'll give you ten pieces of silver a year. And I will keep you in fresh clothing as your pay. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man became to him like one of his sons. Verse 12, Micah ordained the Levite. Well, I thought the Levite was already ordained. But if you're going to have your own church, you know, I guess you, and, and you're the, you know, the head of that church, right? Then I guess, you know, you, you have to do what you have to do. And you have to ordain uh, this Levite in order to become suitable for service in your little worship center. And uh, so uh, he ordained a Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Now, I, I want you to see in the closing verse of uh, this sordid chapter uh, what the response of Micah is here. Micah is beside himself with enthusiasm and excitement and joy. Now I know that Yahweh will prosper me because I have a Levite for a priest. It makes you wonder uh, what's going on in Micah's, the empty space between Micah's ears. Could it? No, it couldn't be. Couldn't possibly be this. Well, it may be. Could it be that when you jettison the truth and when you forsake the author of that truth and you begin to think more of yourself than is healthy for you to think of yourself and, and you begin to see yourself as the captain of your own ship or the, the master of your own domain, could it be that you become so pragmatic about your view of life that you entirely misinterpret what you believe to be God's favorable providence and fail to understand that this is nothing more than the design and devices of Satan and that they smell like smoke. Now I know that Yahweh will prosper me because I have my own personal talisman. You know what a talisman is? It's like a lucky charm. It's a rabbit's foot. I find it interesting that people are so superstitious by nature. Don't you, I, don't you think that's interesting? That how superstitious baseball players. 
I mean, they'll go a whole season wearing dirty underwear. Because they think dirty underwear somehow gives them luck. Or grow a beard. You know, until it gets in the way of batting and pitching. Because if you shave your beard, you'll, you'll ruin your lucky streak. I mean, people are just by nature superstitious. Stevie Wonder was right. There is superstition in the land. It's remarkable, I think. And here it is. You know, Micah thinks he's got it all sewed up. That everything is going to come up roses and aces from now on. Because he's got the luckiest lucky charm that ever was, that you could ever have. He's got his own personal Levite. And the providence of God has dumped it right in his own lap for him to take advantage of. Until it doesn't. Chapter 18 opens with these words. In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. Uh, for until then there was no inheritance among the tribes that had fallen to them. And so you go back, you go down, 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 and you come to this uh, sordid story about them coming uh, to Micah's house. And uh, so you have these scouts going out in verse 16, the Danites, uh, they send out, they, they send out five men from these scouts to go. And uh, they, in verse 18, when these went into Micah's house, uh, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? Why are you taking Micah's gods and his images and his ephod? And why are you doing these things? Verse 19, uh, these soldiers said, well, keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and, and come with us. And, and be a father to us and be a priest to us. And, and here's the hook. You know, here's, this is the bait and the hook that they use. Is it better for you to be the priest to the house of one man or to be a priest to the tribe and clan of Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods, and the carved image, and he went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and goods in front of them. And when they've gone a long distance from the home of Micah, the men who were uh, with, uh, the men who were in the house, houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan, and they had this confrontation and so forth. Why did you take my gods, you know? Well, why did you take my gods? What God can be taken? So here you have, uh, basically, then, uh, the, the, I think the second thing uh, that we need to focus our attention on here, and that is that uh, um, because it is in a, a natural inclination for us to reinterpret the providence of God to our own advantage, this is, this is a, a lesson that we, we need to come to grips with. Uh, just because something happens in our lives that seems like a good providence doesn't necessarily mean it is a good providence. Again, everything that happens to us in our lives, whether we think it's evil or good, has to be interpreted through the lens of Scripture to find out whether or not it is truly a good thing or a bad thing. Because a lot of stuff that happens to us we think is a bad thing, but it ends up being a good thing. And a lot of stuff that we assume is a good thing ends up being not so good after all. 
And so here's poor Micah. You know, he thinks he's got it made uh, uh, until the providence of God that he had put his hope and faith in and misinterpreted because he had neglected the truth of God's word now finds himself without anything. But the priest has landed on his feet. <laughs> and now he's interpreted this as his providence. This is a good thing. Hey, the benefits are so much better. You know, being the priest of a, a clan, a tribe of Israel, as opposed to being you know, a priest in a little house, that, that's kind of puny. There is a mercenary attitude going on here. This morning, in our confession of sin, we find these words. Uh, you bid us come and drink deeply from the cup of blessing, the sweet wine of the gospel, but we draw from broken cisterns the putrid water of our own self-righteousness. You set before us a board lavishly supplied with every good food, wisely and wonderfully prepared, spiritual food upon which we can be continually nourished and eternally satisfied. Yet we content ourselves with stolen bread eaten in secret. Such is our sinful nature. We seek satisfaction from the creation while forsaking the creator who alone can satisfy our deepest longings and fill our souls to overflowing. Forgive us for exalting ourselves and using your blessed son as though he were some charming commodity, a talisman, sent to serve our selfish ends. We need all of us to be delivered from this mercenary attitude. We, we need to be delivered from the pragmatism that oftentimes accompanies our thoughts as we try to read God's will uh, from the circumstances that he and his good providence has granted to be our current realities. We need to be careful that we don't assume or presume upon God's providence and try to fit it uh, into our own personal narratives. Because when we do that, we are forsaking the creator and we are embracing the creature. The priesthood is a good thing for Israel. Uh, it is by means of the priesthood that God is able uh, to have a relationship with a sinful race. God established the priesthood as a means by which the sin of his people could be atoned covered with the blood of the sacrifice of the lamb. And the priest was to administer uh, that Old Testament structure in such a way as to be faithful himself, offering a sacrifice for his own sin before he could offer the sacrifice for the sins of of his people. And all of these things that God ordained to be the old covenant rites uh, that are associated with tabernacle and temple worship. All of these things obviously uh, were not meant to uh, hold water for long. Uh, they were designed by God to point everybody, including the original recipients of these signs and seals, 
uh, to a greater um, reality, which obviously we find uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see in the Lord Jesus Christ the fulfillment of the Levitical priesthood. Uh, we see a greater priest because he is in the order of Melchizedek than even the Levitical priesthood. Uh, we see in Jesus a greater prophet than Moses, and we see in Jesus a greater king than David. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the prophet, the priest, and the king. And the book of Hebrews is, if nothing else, about showing what a wonderful and magnificent priest the Lord Jesus Christ is. The assurance of pardon. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the great high priest, but he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world to be the only way that we could ever be justified in the sight of God, to have our sins covered and atoned, and to be given his perfect righteousness. That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Was it John Owen who wrote the book, The Death of Death in the Death of Christ? What a title. The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. That's what Hebrews is teaching us right here. That death has been put to death by virtue of the death of Christ. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Think of it. Does anybody here have a famous relative? You know, a brother perhaps, or a sister, or uncle, grandfather, whatever. Um, we, we think in terms of uh, those kinds of associations, familial associations. People do genealogies to find out where they came from and all of that to see what significant descendants might you know, might be had. It's important uh, to, to, I remember when I was, I think it was in third grade and JFK was coming to Groton, Connecticut to visit the, the boat building plant, EB, Electric Boat Company, where they made submarines. And, and uh, you know, it was so exciting. You know, we, we, we were taken out of school and we went down to George Washington Park and we, we uh, lined up on the sidewalk while the motorcade passed by, and it was such a significant event. I, I still remember it as, as, you know, I actually saw the President of the United States. We have something so much better. We, we don't have to look 
at a motorcade from a distance. We have the one who is God himself emptying himself of the position and coming into this world and taking upon himself human flesh. So that not only could he be our great prophet, priest, and king, but so that he could be our brother, our brother. The prophet and the priest and the king is our brother. We have royal blood coursing through our veins by virtue of our union with Christ. Kind of makes everything else seem rather cheap and tawdry, doesn't it? To recognize what God has done, what this represents, this table before us represents. So as we, as we gather together around this table, let these thoughts fill our hearts and our minds with the reality that God's word has declared to be true and let everything else simply slough off and be done with. Because there is nothing more important to a believing heart than to know what our position is in this world. What God's calling is upon our life. What our duty is uh, to him. And what a great blessing it is uh, to have him so close, so near. Father, we pray now that you would be pleased to take the food that we have just uh, consumed, this word that you have given to us, and let it find its place upon the tablet of our heart. And now we pray also that you would so work in us to prepare us uh, to receive the, the further grace that you have for us this morning as we gather around your table and we feed by faith upon the very body and drink the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would take these common elements and set them apart for a holy use. We pray, our Father, that, that you would take our hearts and our minds and that you would work in them in such a way as to sanctify them further. Set them apart more appropriately for your service. We thank you for all these things. And we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let me read uh, the words of instruction as they are found in 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 as we prepare our hearts. Paul writes uh, to the church in Corinth, I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, who eats of the bread and drinks of the cup in a, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. The table that is set before us is not Presbyterian. Uh, It is a table that is set uh, for all of those who are united uh, by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and are obedient members uh, in his church. And so if you are visiting from another church and uh, you have a conscience that has been cleared by the blood of Christ, and you are uh, living uh, in good faith uh, as a member of a, of a church, uh, then you are invited uh, to this table as, as well. Um, I'll ask the elders uh, to come forward and administer uh, the elements to us. The Lord's Supper is not for perfect people, obviously, because nobody would be able to partake. Uh, It's for sinners, though. It's for sinners who are saved by grace. And, And as the elements are being distributed and as you hold them, uh, take the time Uh, to think upon uh, what we have been exposed to by God's grace this morning about our standing um, with the Lord Jesus Christ, our union with him, uh, him being our great high priest, him being the great sacrifice uh, for our sins, uh, his act of obedience on our behalf, the righteousness that he earned in a human body which he gives to us and the sin that he took upon himself uh, in order that he might put to death the deeds of death. Think upon these things as you come. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said to them, This is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. 
I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever.
once again unite our hearts in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and expressing that love, demonstrating that love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. We pray for your church. We pray that your church would be purified, that your spirit and your word uh, might go forth from pulpits with power, preaching the whole counsel of God, and that people would respond. We pray that you would fill pulpits with men who are not ashamed of the gospel, who will preach the entire counsel of the word of God, and that the people might be blessed, those who are languishing and starving for the true word of God, that they would be blessed in the hearing, that they would feast upon your word, and that it would bear fruit in their lives and hearts. We pray for missionaries uh, that take the gospel where we cannot go. And so we lift up to you Aldo and Abby and that precious family at uh, the University of South Florida with Reformed University Fellowship. And we pray for a woman's place medical clinic and for the work of uh, introducing uh, couples to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, so that they might be saved even as the unborn children that they have conceived might be saved uh, from the brutal uh, process of abortion. We pray for Chuck and Celia Williams and for Christ the King Chapel in Wesley Chapel and pray that as they uh, uh, work the fields in that area uh, that they would find uh, families that are interested in in becoming a part of a new church uh, to worship in. We pray uh, for our marriages, for our families. We pray that uh, our, our families would reflect uh, the very nature of the relationship that exists between Christ as the bridegroom and the church as his bride, that we would love one another uh, fervently uh, with the love of Christ as we have been loved. Uh, we pray, our Father, uh, for Steve and Nancy and pray that you'll continue to bless them as they serve you and serve us here in this church. And we pray particularly for Nancy that you would grant to her uh, health and healing and that she will soon be back uh, on her feet and without pain. Lord, we live in a culture that is more interested uh, in doing what is right in its own eyes uh, than certainly doing what is right. And we pray that uh, you would restrain the evil of uh, the fallen human nature uh, that we see all around us so that the church might be able to minister the gospel uh, without interference and without, uh, uh, without fear. We pray that uh, you would uh, use the church as a, a means by which uh, people might be exposed to the light and the life of Christ. We pray for our president, for his cabinet, for the House, the Senate, the courts. Uh, we pray that uh, you would awaken them uh, to their selfishness, their avarice, and their greed for those who are without Christ. For those who are without Christ, we pray that you would bring them uh, by your spirit and by your word to Christ, that you would give them a sense of the awesome um, accountability to which they will be held for what they do uh, in positions that they hold, whether for good or evil. We pray, our Father, for our warriors uh, who are either at home or overseas. Particularly do we pray for those who uh, uh, perhaps might be in harm's way and ask that you'll protect and keep. Uh, we pray for our, our police, our, our sheriffs, our troopers, we pray for our, our first responders, the, the fire, uh, 
firefighters and uh, ambulance drivers and, and, and emergency room uh, personnel and ask that you'll bless them and help them to understand the nature of their calling and to do that calling for your honor and for your glory and for the good of those whom they serve. We pray for one another as we lift up uh, each one uh, who has a particular need to you. We pray that you'll be with those who have been diagnosed with debilitating disease. We pray for the aged uh, who find it more and more difficult uh, to get up and to even uh, be ready for church. We pray for those uh, who are weighed down by perhaps a guilty conscience because of sin that has been uh, coddled and, uh, and entertained. And we pray that you will bring them uh, to repentance and the freedom of conscience in Christ that that alone can bring. We pray for those who are weighed down by their cares and concerns uh, of living out the ordinary workaday world and pray that you'll bless and keep uh, your people. Father, help us, uh, we pray, uh, uh, to use the gifts that you have given to us, uh, the, the time and the talent and the treasure, uh, to be good stewards of these things and to use them uh, appropriately for your glory and for the good of your people and for the good of those who are around us. And in that way, uh, may the light shine in the darkness and people see uh, the, the, the love of Christ uh, reflected in our own uh, attitudes and, and words and actions. Bless us now as we give back to you that which you have first given to us. Take these uh, monies, these gifts, and use them uh, to further publish the beauty and the glory of our triune God and uh, of the, uh, uh, the wondrous work of our great prophet and our priest and our king. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Jesus, my great high priest. Now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. glorious day the Lord has given us. What a glorious worship uh, service and what a glorious God uh, we worship. Um, just uh, call your attention to page 11 in your bulletins to be up to date on everything that is going on 
Uh, you can see the times of all the things that are happening. Uh, take special note of the fact that uh, uh, Arlene Brewer's uh, memorial service uh, will be on the 20th at 2 p.m. here at the church. Uh, we do have a date and a time for Carol Beerling's service, which will be, I believe, on the 11th. It'll be in the morning at 11 o'clock, is that right? Yeah. And uh, so put that on your calendar as well. And uh, anything else? Uh, updates? Yes. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right, if there's nothing else, oh yeah, go ahead, Bill. I'll just mention, actually, sorry, I was reminded by others who aren't always here to speak in the microphone so they can hear me. So just real quick, sorry, James, just to, for those online who didn't hear, it's, uh, James gave her a reminder about the church picnic coming up. Uh, <clears throat> just real quick update on the pulpit search committee. Uh, we're making some good progress. That church information packet that I keep talking about, we should be buttoning that up here. Goal is to button that up this week and get it over to the session this week. And then ideally to <clears throat> get it posted on the PCA website within the next two weeks or so. That's all I have. Thanks. All good news. A uh, reminder that there is no Sunday school today, is that right? And no uh, fellowship dinner either because we have had so many other things Re recently. So you are dismissed. Uh, you can enjoy refreshments and spend some time together. to introduce our organist. Uh, this is Nancy Fannin, and uh, Nancy is uh, filling in for uh, Peggy, who's filling in for Lynn, uh, and so, and so uh, make sure that you welcome her and thank her for uh, her service this morning. Nancy has agreed to help us as much as she's able to help us in filling in for the times that Peggy's not going to be able to be here. So the Lord has truly provided for us in this very special and unique need of our church. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great service.